Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, the show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives from the world's leading global brands. Today, we have a, a special show for you. As you can see, we've got three guests. I'm joined by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrett Jones, who are the authors of the best selling book, The Curious Advantage. Welcome, everyone. How are you? Fine. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us. Fantastic. Twice in one twice in one week, Simon. I know. <laughs> you're working me hard, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Before we jump in, um, just each of you give everyone a, just a quick overview of sort of your background experience to where we are today. We'll start with yourself, Simon. Yeah, so Simon Brown, uh, 20 plus years in the learning world, uh, last seven years at Novartis, where I'm Chief Learning Officer. Hello, Paul. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Ashcroft, co-founder of Ludic Group. Uh, Ludic works uh, all around the world, helping organizations make the shift to digital. Garrett, last but not least. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm the other co-founder of Ludic with Paul, <laughs> and we, we work with everybody around the world. But I'm also a composer and a musician and uh, write a lot of music and things. Amazing. First and foremost, how did you all meet? So about seven years ago, um, so it was just after I joined Novartis, um, I joined in a role to look at our sales and marketing training globally, uh, and we ran a visioning workshop to bring lots of people together, uh, and I needed help in doing that, um, and Paul and Garrick came in to help uh, sort of structure the ideas and... Um, yeah, come up with some of the visual things which you may have seen on LinkedIn, some of our visual scribes. Mm -hmm. um, they brought some of those artists. And yeah, we came up with the vision around a capability building academy. Um, so that, that was the start of our working relationship, but also our friendship. Yeah. yeah. So you're not fed up with each other yet, then you've survived this long. When did the um, idea for the book first uh, become conceived? Well, we wanted to tell the story of how organizations have put curiosity at the center of how they're uh, making that shift into digital. Now, curiosity is something everybody has. As we talk about it, people become intrigued even by the idea of curiosity, but not everybody knows how to use it. So we became really fascinated about how people and, and their organizations can become more successfully curious. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were talking a lot, Simon, Paul and myself, about all the work that Simon was doing and we were working with him on learning and we thought we might be writing a book about learning. But then as we progressed through that process, hey, Simon, it turned into a book about curiosity because we found that that was the, the, the main theme that wove it all together. Yeah, it was a it was a fateful dinner. So I'd had two people um, say to me in the space of a week, um, completely independently, it's like you should write a book about what you're doing at Novartis. And Paul and Garrick had written a book before, um, and so we were having dinner, and uh, it was like, yeah, tell me about the experience of writing a book. And um, yeah, we decided let's do it together, uh, and it evolved from an original concept into something I think so much richer. And I mean, it's a great argument for diversity of thought that uh, if, if it had been a, I probably would never have finished it if it had been just me. Either. We wouldn't be having this conversation now. But the diversity of thought across the three of us, I think, has, has brought a, a, a very different slant and a much stronger slant to uh, to what it would have otherwise been. So, Does it make it more difficult when there's three of you writing one book or easier? <laughs> it, it depends on your process, actually. And we have a very nice process using tools like Evernote. And we also started with a really fuzzy idea of like all the data we could think of and all the areas, putting them together and went through sort of iterative cycles of clustering, 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 allowing the themes to emerge. And then we put a very bad bad, bad version together, printed that out, and then started the, the editing process, which of course brings in more research as we went through. Oh, is that the original? <laughs> yeah. one, of, one of the early versions with That's scribbles amazing. all over it. And, uh, is, that, is, that, so, is that a common practice in writing a book to do something? I don't know. I don't know, but it's a process that comes out of our work on decision making and all the oh, fuzzy okay. logic it's associated with. The, you know, it's also very similar to a composition process that we use in music and, and for productions mm. and stuff. So that kind of translated into the Evernote process, and and you know, become it's like sharpening a pencil. Things become clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer as you move through it. Yeah, we had, we had weekly check-ins as well between us, and those weekly check-ins sort of kept us, or certainly kept me motivated. Of you know, got to do said I'll do this bit by the next week, and it, it's sort of that almost social contract between us <laughs> yeah. that, that yeah. created the motivation to actually do it. So. Yeah, how long did it take? It's yeah. actually amazing. It took a year, yeah. and and that's that is fast. 
I mean, we started probably July with concept. By October, we had a first sort of clustering of research. And by November, we had a bad manuscript. So um, <laughs> it was it was good, very good. Yeah. How do you, for everyone listening, how do you define curiosity? I think for us, curiosity is really about wondering, but putting that wonder into action. It's not just asking what if or thinking about that might be nice. It's really about having a go and giving it a try and, and getting involved and learning by doing, we think. Curiosity is about exploration fundamentally. And we think um, you could sum it up a little bit like it's an attitude of wonder while cultivating a spirit of adventure. It's that idea of having an attitude of wonder and then being brave enough or to cultivate that adventurous spirit and go for it. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's uh, now more important than ever given yeah. current events, right? Absolutely. I mean, we talk all about the impact of digital and we can talk about that in more detail because now everyone's faced with, you know, an infinite amount of information when you know, the internet and digital. The question, of course, is what do you do with that and how do you navigate that and how do you make that useful and use it in a powerful way? And we think that there are huge components around um, curiosity that allows you to make sense of, of the digital age. And the world's changing so fast. There's no clear right answer anymore. You can't if you if you take the way it was done before. That that's no longer the way of, of the future. So being curious about what are the different ways that you can do this, and then putting that curiosity into action through experimentation, um, gives you a way to navigate in the in the ambiguity and the the, the rapid change that we're seeing. Yeah. I, I feel like that's one of the reasons why we came through as I, uh, as I said when we spoke yesterday, Simon, is that what my co-founder Shane always has a go at me because he's like, Chris, you're always looking at these other things outside of our business. I'm always looking at new innovations, new products, new technology. I'm obsessed with these new things. And uh, and when COVID hit, we I felt like we were so much more prepared because we had our hands in so many different areas and we're always learning. So we're like, we already knew how to move to our face-to-face -face workshops and events online because we'd already been dabbling in that space and we had the skill sets internally to be able to do so. So it's quite an easy pivot for us because we always remain curious uh, about doing that. And that kind of feels like that's part of the DNA of the team. There's always some, every one of us are always working on a little side hustle project mm -hmm. in, in, in our teams. And I've always encouraged that with everyone, even when it fails. I'm like, don't worry, because it mean, I, I want you to continue to come to me, even when it seems crazy, <laughs> just keep, keep going. And um, I'll, I'll be honest, that, that was just, that wasn't even, I think that was, it was unintentional. It was just, I did it. So it seems the team just kind of followed that. And old Chris does it all the time. He's coming to us with these crazy ideas. So every every time we have our, our Monday morning meeting, I always ask the team, you know, what are some of the new discoveries or things that you've come across? Just bring them in, even if they're not even relating to our current projects and what we're doing. And some of our best innovations have come from that. It's, it's so powerful that. I mean, we've had a similar experience in as much as we've always wanted to employ a diverse group of people as much as possible and uh, and the digital world allow us uh, you know to employ single mothers um, people in slightly different cir circumstances people who are older and that and we've also really encouraged people uh, we've got people on our team who are opera singers and are still professionally you know opera singers but they're also professional consultants alongside us and that kind of diversity just keeps things popping all the time Mm -hmm. We had a we got a podcast that goes with the book, and we had a, a conversation with Chris Meyer, future futurologist, the other day, and uh, he he was giving the example of curiosity of ants and a Big Mac. So he was saying, uh, if you imagine an ant hill and a Big Mac as the food source, and the ants go to the Big Mac and they keep going back, and then one day it rains and the Big Mac washes away. And you need to then be curious to go off and find that next source. But if you're not curious, you keep going back to where the Big Mac was and mm -hmm. you find nothing's there and you come back and you keep going back. And it's the curiosity that takes you off in spirals to where's the next food source. And ideally, that curiosity is going on all the time. So before the food source, the Big Mac washes away, you've already found your, your next source of food. It's quite a, a nice story to put, make uh, curiosity real. I love the fact his go-to was Big Mac. When yes, absolutely. Like, what piece of food? <laughs> Big Mac. Everyone. Well, he, he was talking about the history of all time, you know, from the Big Bang <laughs> to the, the Big, Big Mac. Mac. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Um, why is curiosity so important in organizations? I know it's part of your values, right, Simon, at Novartis. Why have you put yeah. that as part of the heart of the business in terms of 
uh, your sort of why, your purpose statement, your values? Yeah, I mean, at the heart of being a, a pharmaceutical medicines company, um, we need to be innovating. We need to be discovering new ways to um, to help patients around the world and improve and enhance their lives. So we need to have that constant innovation. And behind that constant innovation is that curiosity. And so we've set a, um, a culture or we are working on a culture journey. Uh, towards being inspired, curious, and unbossed. Um, so if we have people who are inspired around a greater purpose with the energy to be able to fulfill that, if they're curious to ask questions and to be constantly learning, and if they're unbossed where they're working with psychological safety and an environment where the, the manager is there to bring out the best from the team and recognizes the answer is usually in the team, then those things will actually make us successful. So curiosity fits into that broader culture journey around inspired, curious, and unbossed. Um, and we're now two years into that journey, um, seeing very positive momentum. I mean, if we look at some of the, the metrics, we've seen um, engagement scores considerably increasing over that time. We've seen satisfaction around learning going up over that time, um, and we've seen performance um, increasing. We had our probably arguably best year uh, ever last year as a company. So Wow. Sure, it probably helps when you have a um, one. You've got where you've got a CEO that's fully behind you, right? I've seen the episode. Yeah, yeah. The CEO absolutely. And, and you know, two, very fortunate. Yep. Yeah, and two, you have the ROI. You can measure Ooh. curiosity. And here's the data. Well, we're we're working to measure it. I think we, we have a lot of measures. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying we have an absolute. You know, here is how you measure yeah, exactly. it. But uh, we were certainly working towards it. Yeah, yeah. That's right. It's definitely the it's on the research program. You know, we know how to measure innovation and its impact on the on the organization. And now we're just trying to extend that to curiosity and its impact on value specifically. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that we went into yesterday, Simon, which I want to bring up again is, can you learn to be more curious? Yeah, I mean, I can I can pick this one up. I mean, I think we think curiosity is like a muscle. That you have to work or you have to keep training it's when we ask people they say oh yeah i'm really curious but then we say well what have you done with that and they say well actually i haven't really done very much with it i i kind of wondered you know what would it be like to travel should i learn a new language could i change jobs but they're still in the same job and still speaking the same language and it's about putting it into action every day and i think and we found this in our research actually they're just some good ingredients or things you can do to be more successfully curious. You know, one of which I think we were talking about earlier is about community, connecting with other people, building a diverse set of people around you. Um, maybe it's about curating all of the information and so you start to focus. And then it's just about trying, getting on and doing it, seeing what works, Chris, as you said in your company, allow people to, to get on with it, allow them to fail, try again, and, uh, and see what comes next. Do you want to add anything to that, Garrett? <laughs> I think I think there's no doubt um, that curiosity can be learned. There's no doubt that we can teach our kids to be more curious and to be safe and give them the school skills and tools that allow them to really explore the world and, and feel that the world is their oyster. And it, you know, as Paul was saying, you know, sometimes we forget how to do that as adults because we framed by our experience or we framed by the work or whatever. Our, you know, but yet there is huge advantage to you know slowing down in order to speed up curiosity is something that we can really put into practice on a daily basis and also it makes our lives more fun and more joy joyful I mean, we can talk about the impact of the you know what happens in our brains when when we're curious but it certainly is linked to um, endorphins and it's linked to that kind of feeling of, of happiness we get when we're starting to explore things and to, yeah. to build on that, I mean, we come up with a, a model in the in the book called uh, The Seven Seas or Sailing the Seven Seas of Curiosity. And as you go through those seas, the, the final one is around confidence. So as you go through being curious, we found that builds your confidence. And actually, that then takes you back to the start of the model that the more confident you are, the more then you can be curious and, and try out and be creative to try other things, which in turn builds further confidence. So, so once you get started in being curious, that can perpetuate in a sort of virtuous circle to actually build build your curiosity even further. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear more about how it affects the, the brain, Garrick, because when I always just, my friends always say to me, Chris, you're really annoying because you're good at everything, but you get to a certain level and you get bored and leave. So for yeah. me, the, the drug and the addiction is being really bad at something, mm. getting really good at it. But when I get really good at it, I get bored. 
Well, I, I had to... And I'm off to the next thing again. So my, one of my employees for Secret Santa actually bought me a book says how to be good at everything because you're really yeah. annoying. And I do explain to people, like, the buzz I get out of being terrible at it and getting good at it is it's like an addiction. Yeah. I really feel addicted to... And I'm like, what's next? I'm good at that now. Forget about that. What, what else can I get good at? And is, yeah. there, is there something happening in, on, in, in my brain, a chemical balance? Does, does, what's going on in there? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on there. I, I have very... <laughs> I relate to that a, a lot because I remember it was about the third time that somebody broke up with me when I was much younger. The thing they said when they broke up was like, you know, everything, you know, too much or you <laughs> and, and know it all. And it was after, you know, after that was became a continuous process in my life that I started to reevaluate and think, you know, maybe it's not about trying to be the person who knows everything. <laughs> maybe it's about um, or presenting yourself like that. Maybe there's something else to it. And I sort of have had to learn the hard way to um, to really be open and to understand that it's okay to be wrong or it's okay not to know. Because I came, you know, I was one of those kids who could play the piano and speak and, and do things. And I was, uh, you know, had all that stuff going on for me, which is a, is a, both a, a good thing and, and sometimes gets in the way. Um, the thing about the, the, the hormones though, that the brain secretes is all about curiosity and wonder and exploration. The moment you try and ask questions and start to do things, you have physical reactions in the body. I think of the brain as an extension throughout the entire body, through our, our nervous system. And what happens is the brain secretes the famous flight or fight um, endorphins and hormones. And in order to learn new things, for example, you can learn completely new context. That is, you might be laying down pathways or learning things you've never been exposed to before. You have to um, react to that. And what our brain and our body does is it goes into a sort of a, a, an advanced state of precaution. And uh, because it's something new and it doesn't know whether it's dangerous or we're going to be safe and we don't know whether it's, we're going to come out on the other side. So, But it's a heightened awareness. And that heightened awareness is accompanied when, it, as, Paul, uh, as Simon were talking about confidence, once you start moving to a point where the other um, uh, pathways are being laid down and hormones are being released that are about confidence, you, you move to a different place where learning starts to be encoded in the body. So pathways are laid down, neural pathways are laid down through a process of wonder. And then a process of confidence has, a, has a, a, an impact of releasing endorphins and hormones that, that make it stick. So curiosity, wonder, confidence, feeling safe has a direct impact on the physical neurological status of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and it, we also think, and there's some research to indicate that it has an impact on people with Alzheimer's, that the more curious you are younger, and if you keep people stimulated and you keep people asking questions and you keep them open to new ideas, the brain continues to release um, uh, hormones like dopamine, for example, which keep um, Alzheimer's at bay. And so on. So there's a there's a we there, there may even be a long term health benefit for being curious. Mm -hmm. well, I heard I've seen some research about learning new languages and the effect that it has on Alzheimer's, building that mm -hmm. pathway to keeping your brain active as well. Yes. Yeah. Does it work? Uh, does, sorry, one second. Does it work in opposite effect though? The people lay down pathways that have a negative experience of learning, and then that can compound. Would you think it will work the same way? Because I have certain friends that had a terrible experience with perhaps school or or work from a learning perspective That's, that have a very negative approach to it. They don't want to take risk and they get yeah. anxious and it's like compounding the other direction. Um, it's, it's all learning though, it, whether it's negative or positive, it's it's all learning. The brain doesn't distinguish between a positive or a negative, dis doesn't make a judgment in that oh, okay. way. It's still laying down learning. And if your learning is to become unsafe and risk averse and continually risk averse, you simply following those pathways. It's one of the reasons, I know Paul wants to make a point, but one of the reasons we talk about critical bias and unconscious bias and criticality in our book, and it's really important, aha, for, for me personally, as, as well as the other guys, about the fact that if we become aware of our unconscious bias and the things that we, you know, the ideas that are formed already, um, that's the thing that opens us up to new experiences. Because if we are biased about something, it might take us down a pathway where we feel only comfortable and only safe, or perhaps we're only exploring pleasure. And yet, that's not going to teach us new things. By being aware that, hang on, 
maybe the, the, the tension I'm experiencing here relates to my bias against a situation or my bias against a person, for example, or, uh, you know, whatever, that being aware of our unconscious bias allows us to remain open and keep open, understand that all learning is fundamentally difficult. All learning fundamentally triggers uh, a, a, a state within us that is about um, slight fear and unease. And it's when you get used to that being uneasy um, that you really start to learn. Paul, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I just wanted to add that one of the things that we uh, we really liked when we were finding out about curiosity, and I've been trying to tell my kids this now, having done three months of lockdown homeschooling, is that if you approach something with a curious mind, no matter how dull it is, you will learn uh, quicker, you will learn better, you'll retain more information. So simply the act of approaching something by being curious improves your learning. I think, Simon, you've seen some evidence mm. of this as well. Yeah, so we, so we cite this in the book. So uh, there's an example from Harvard Business Review from uh, it Erica Anderson, um, who talks about someone that she was aware of who was had to, it was a lawyer who had to learn a new area of um, legal knowledge that was the dullest area that they <laughs> they uh, could think of. And they had to move into this area and learn this whole wealth of information. Uh, and through reframing that uh, in, a, in a mode of curiosity of, okay, what is it about this that um, you know, hundreds and thousands of lawyers find interesting and make their career? What is it about this that will actually help me it to achieve these things? By adding that lens of curiosity, that created the motivation to then go on and dive into this content that previously there'd been a big barrier. And th there's other research as well. So, so if you apply that curious lens, actually, yeah, you, you learn better. I have to say my kids haven't bought it yet. <laughs> Still trying to persuade them. Yeah. What do you say to people that I, I love your point earlier about you know you start? I always say to teams seek discomfort. Is that when when I feel most uncomfortable with I know that's where the progress happens. Mm. And I was quite lucky that that was embedded in me from a kid because I played sports. So I knew I was going to be terrible at ice hockey when I st first started playing. I knew I was going to be terrible. At, you know all of the tennis, but a lot of sports that we played. Mm. Myself, Shane, when we we both played competitively for you know GB ice hockey team and we we fell on our face a million times and we lost games so we experienced a lot of failure but we understood that that was the path to success and that was okay um, very on so when we got into business we didn't realize how powerful that would be for us where everyone else and we had a sort of a cohort of 20 graduates that came into this job and i think about five of us survived because everyone else, everyone else was saying oh my god that person said no it's just sales by the way b2b sales floor pretty tough you know sort of like uh, just a uh, sink or swim type environment and we were like, this is fine. We were, and we were wondering why everyone around us was saying, this is so hard. Someone said no. And, and we were like, what do you mean? Did, of course they said no. You've done one call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and we didn't get it. And we were very successful in that environment because we understood that being uncomfortable was just the path to success for us. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I was really frustrated about people around us. Like, why don't you understand this? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Run towards that failure. Uh, it, it's great. But it's, it's hard to deal people. It's, it's what I mean, just to pick up on that, Chris, because I, I love that story. And one of the things that um, I liked about the research that we, we found around confidence is that you talked about it's okay to fail. We fell in our face. It looks like you didn't fall in your face too hard, right? But <laughs> when, you're le when you're learning something uh, new, like, let's, like the guys that are learning to rock climb, those the crazy guys that will climb up the sheer face of a rock, um, it's not the sort of thing you wake up on a Sunday morning and think, I'm going to go climb up the top of that 100 hundred meter rock face. Uh, the way they do it is they climb up a little bit and then deliberately allow themselves to fall, climb up a little bit more and deliberately allow themselves to fall. So the way you build up confidence that we found and learned about is that it's not just about knowing you can do it well and get it right, it's knowing you can cope when you get it wrong and allowing yourself to do those incremental failures like fall on your face, try a bigger game, miss that goal, um, whatever it is, but do it in a safe way that doesn't completely knock you off. So you're never prepared to do it again. If you can get that balance right, that's what really starts to accelerate your confidence. And that's what builds your curiosity as well. 
And to be able to get those failures, you then need the safe environment, the psychological safety where those failures can be accepted. Because moving that to a business environment, if the first time you fall off the rock face, you die, then so the first time you fail an organization, you know, you're penalized for it or you're out, you won't be able to learn from that and, and have that experience that, that Paul described. So I think that's yeah. where the, the whole piece around creating the psychological safety where people can try things, can experiment, can learn from that failure, is crucial otherwise the whole thing just doesn't work and you won't get that curiosity we had some some interesting research where we looked at the um difference between a a manager that someone would rate as favorable and a manager that uh, they would rate as unfavorable and we did this at scale across the organization looking at the, the results of um one of our engagement surveys and what we saw was the difference uh, in curiosity of someone who's had a favorable manager or an unfavorable manager was the highest impact across any of the behavioral metrics. And we saw a 22 point difference between a favorable manager and an unfavorable manager around the question on curiosity. So what that tells us is if you have a man who is supported, not to push Finally, boundaries, you you won't try things out. You, if, yeah, you won't, um, you won't experiment because there's not that safe environment. So yeah. I can't remember the exact name of the company, but when, when I had my last uh, show yesterday with Chester and Dave Warwick, they were mentioning a company that at the end of their sort of sales, end of the end of their year sort of uh, company retreat, they actually take along, they asked each leader to take along five employees that over exceeded and then take five employees that failed, but to celebrate them on stage. So to take, you know, these people did incredibly well and use five well done, you know, and treated them in the same manner. Yeah. to show everyone that you know by even though you failed we're gonna we're gonna celebrate that in front of the whole organization and i thought that was pretty incredible because there's one thing we, we had take, that but you need to demonstrate it as an organization we had that last year in our hr awards we had uh, an award that was for the i can't remember the exact words but it was essentially you know the greatest moment of learning which was the, essentially the, the greatest thing that didn't go as planned uh, that we were able to learn from um so it, that same principle yeah yeah. It's like we like to say you want high volume failure with high volume, low impact failure rather than high impact, low volume failure. You don't want the one mistake that breaks the bank. Yeah. What you want is thousands of little failures that actually allow you to target pretty much like a missile gets to its target. You know, missiles move all over the place while they triangulating to get where they want to go. You know, it's wrong. 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 It's right. And it's that idea of like high volume, low impact failure that allows um, sort of this amorphous cloud of networked organizations to kind of get where they want to go these days. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was a great discussion with Josh Burson that we had on the podcast with him because um, he did the, the foreword for the book um, where we talked about failure. Actually, failure often isn't failure. If we if we reframe failure as actually we learned a way that didn't work, yes. it's a very different way of looking at it that we, we tried three things. Two of them didn't go as planned, but we can take this learnings from them. One was pretty, but it's not failures. It's just we learned these ways didn't work. Yeah. It's interesting trying to reframe that for years. It's taken me quite a long time to see <laughs> failure, the word failure itself as a positive. Yep. Yeah. Uh, especially in school where I failed at all of my exams. <laughs> <Got everything. laughs> and all of a sudden, it was a very negative experience for me. And now it's like failure is great. You know, what did I learn from it? Um, so look where you are now. Exactly. It's where um, it gets you. You know, I bet you even that even failure at work was teaching you things. <laughs> teaching you things perhaps you didn't like. Te teaching you where you didn't yeah. where you didn't want to be. <laughs> exactly. It's all learning. Yeah. What other things stop people from being curious? You mentioned psychological safety, which I'm sure is one, of course. Are there any other things that stop us from becoming curious? So there's a, a model that we talk about in the book from um, Dr. Diane Hamilton, um, who's she's the author of a, a book, The Curiosity Code. Uh, and she's come up with a, a model called FATE, um, which stands for fear, uh, assumptions, technology and environment. Uh, and she has a, um, a survey that goes with that that actually looks at um, yeah what what are your personal barriers to, um, to to stopping curiosity and yeah around the, those four elements. So at a personal level, I think some, something like that is is helpful to understand. I think at an organisational level, then um, some of the things we talked about of yeah, fear of failure is there encouragement for asking questions? Is there encourage, encouragement for uh, experimentation? Is there role modelling from leaders? around um, the things that, that are being said of, of con continuous learning, of questioning and things, all of those things, if they're not there, would mm -hmm. be barriers. 
And also mm -hmm. criticality, sometimes we may be afraid of where the answers may lead us, or we might be afraid of what we might learn. And it really is a question of understanding that in every way that you, if you want to be curious or ask a question or go somewhere, it's going to take, a, you're going to need courage and you're going to need to be able to face things, whether it's dealing with data sets in an organization or it's dealing with something you personally want to learn, uh, it's, it's always going to take courage. And as you said, go to the failure, you know, go to that point where, where you need to be courageous and you're uncomfortable. Yeah, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> Many it, doesn't, it doesn't feel good, but it's worth it because it feels good afterwards, you know. It it's, does. It, you know. Well, I think I've, one thing I'd add to that is that if we went around and asked people, we asked, them, what do you understand by curiosity? And people say, oh, it, it's asking asking why, it's wondering what if. They might tell us curiosity killed the cat because curiosity is a bad thing. Um, but if you ask them, how are you going to be curious? How are you being curious? Uh, we're not sure that many people have a, a really great answer to that, uh, or even if they could articulate how they're being curious. And I think that's what we've been trying to describe in the book around there's actually some really practical things you can do you know you can how you explore how you put people around you how you curate your information and that uh, makes me think how you build how you how you build together sorry how you build yeah. things together to figure it out so it's not just about try fail get a bit better there's actually just some other really there's practical framework. things yeah, there's a framework you can use yeah uh, and paul talks about you know people it reminded me some people aren't curious or they have, or they stop people they stop from being curious because they don't know where to start and, you know, the simplest way of where do I start if I'm curious is to ask another human being. I mean, yes, you can Google, but we talk about community a lot in the book because say, you know, I'm, I want to learn, I'm a musician, I say I want to learn about jazz. Jazz has a huge history and it's got a lot of theory and there's lots of things in, but you go and find a jazz musician and you start to speak with them, they're going to take you into the world of jazz. And the, the most powerful technique, if you have any question or you want to learn something, is go and ask another human being. Yeah, I think people are too afraid, and I, I was just saying, for, to be vulnerable. Yeah. Um, I, I, when, when, this, when COVID hit, I actually, the first thing I did is reached out to quite a few different co-founders that I respect and say, I need your help. <laughs> or what are you doing? And, yeah. you know, and, and I was so, you know, one of them even called me back. I messaged him at like 3 a.m. because I couldn't sleep. I was like, how am I going to? get through it and he called me straight back he was like look i know what you're going through i've been there before and we had a chat about it and i felt very vulnerable and kind of i felt like you know i don't know what i'm doing because i like questioning myself right my own sanity and but i've learned now to that's okay and that's actually a strength i realized yeah. for me actually one of my biggest strengths now is to be vulnerable and ask for help there um, you go. Uh, as well but that's not yeah. easy um, but i think that's a prime example of what we we're saying earlier though, about ambiguity so you're faced with a situation you know no, no one's ever experienced this before yeah. what do you do if you're trying to either use the way you've always done it or do it alone you, you're not going to get the answer you need to then reach out to that community come up with all of the ideas curate those down to, to what's going to work for you uh, and then and then try something so yeah yeah I've got a few questions on LinkedIn. I'm going to get told off if I don't answer them because they keep going <laughs> fast. So um, question for Garrick. Uh, you mentioned that you can measure innovation, um, of, but not curiosity, not yet, shall I say. He said, I imagine that's because there's a clear definition of innovation. How do you define curiosity to make it measurable? Quite yeah, there. that's a, it's a tough question, but it's a great question. And it's exactly where the research is at the moment. Because, you know, measuring innovation and the value of innovation, well, we've been focused on that for about the last 25 years. And there's some great work that's been done um, on how, what are the impact of innovation and how can you define where innovation is to be found and, and all the way through from ideas making creativity all the way through to something being launched into the market. So we know what those variables are. When it comes to being curious, you know, curiosity is a personal trait and it's a behavioral trait, but it also has an impact at a cultural level within an organization. So um, you might say it's a little softer, perhaps, and I don't mean that pejoratively. I mean, it's a little bit more difficult to kind of figure out what are the elements that we need to measure that will tell us that curiosity is pre present? But the, you know, some work has been has been gone down the way of understanding that things things like um, measuring failure, measuring prototypes, 
understanding how much learning is going on in the organization. You know, Simon's organization require people to do or offer people to do 100 hours a year. Um, IBM is another great um, organization as well as Microsoft, which are setting up contexts and technical contexts for enabling people to be curious in the workplace. And with that infrastructure in place, you start to be able to say, okay, lots of people have been doing learning outside of their um, specific area. Lots of people are doing X amount of learning, so clearly they are curious. Lots of people have been doing prototypes and wireframes and failure. You know, so we're starting to understand there's a there's a, a taxonomy, if you want, of what those variables will be. But we're not there yet. It's early days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, another question was: um, Is the practice of humble inquiry another way of demonstrating curiosity? Yeah, I like humble the inquiry. I like the idea of yeah. humble inquiry. I've never heard someone put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's about asking questions. So yes, yeah. uh, I guess I, absolutely. Yeah. Is, is, yeah. is that another way? It's, it's the starting point, isn't it? Asking questions is the starting point of uh, of a curious journey. Uh, humble inquiry is a is a good way to do it, and not just humble, but quiet inquiry. We are we have a very noisy world at the moment. Mm -hmm. Taking some time out to actually reflect and think for yourself. What do I want to do? What am I interested in? What am I curious about? Yeah. And then mapping those questions out is a good way to start. The, knowing what you don't know or knowing that you have a question is always the place to start. I, the, the, pro, the practice of inquiry is is very you know well defined. And um, the practice of humble inquiry allows people to self-reflect. And I would say there's a combination of not only being able to inquire about how things are happening and, and finding you know humility so you can go and find the people to help you take you in. But that reflection on humble inquiry might help you understand where your biases are and the things that, you know, your personal biases that might get in the way or your unconscious bias that might get in the way of your moving forward. So I'd say, yeah, humble uh, inquiry, it's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. what, what have you all learned personally? You've been on this big journey experience together right over the last year longer than that seems what have you learned through your research how has it affected your own curiosity personally through this and the way you look at but the way you look at the world i think for me the it's, it's opened up how much i don't know <laughs> um so it's sort of you you dive dive into it and you sort of see this whole world open up around you to be to be curious about so i think you know for every piece where um we dive into it and think okay i've got a bit more of an understanding around it but you then find 10 things where you can take it further that there's still more room to be curious about so i think it it helped to uh, show <laughs> show me how much i don't know at the moment i think uh for me chris it would be that um, I took it away that it, it, it's nice to know that curiosity is something that I can get better at. And so when I speak to other people and they say, I'd really like to do this. And I say, well, have you done it? Why, why haven't you done it yet? Oh, well, we've got no time, don't know where to start. I don't know who to talk to. So, well, maybe try this. Maybe you could try that. And it's something that you think, well, actually, just like getting fitter by going and working out, it is something you can improve on and then put that, to, put that into good use in your life. Yeah. And for me, I really think it's about connecting to other people because the way my brain, or I've been trained over the years, sort of was taking me down an area of a lot of academic research and a lot of figuring out, okay, so this is the way the world is. And then once I, I had an opinion, that would be the way the world was. And what the curiosity stuff has really started getting me to open up and think about things are much broader than I might understand number one but number two it connects me to other people who may know way more than i do about a specific thing and i think i've become much more open to that and much more relaxed about about not being right i think mm -hmm. yeah it, did you ever discuss because one of the things i struggle with is like my, my me me asking for help at this point is i feel like sometimes i'm too curious and i spend so much time in the exploration but i never end up implementing <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's not curiosity. That's just um, mindless surfing. <laughs> too, much, too much time on the internet, Chris. That's right. No, no, too much no, time no. on your hands. <laughs> I'll listen to a lot of podcasts, read a lot of books, yeah. and I'll take away so many amazing things, but then yeah. I end up spending more time actually consuming than actually executing. Yeah. It's about curation. <laughs> we think that's about yeah. curation. Yeah. I think Gary said this earlier. It's like we have an infinite world of information. Yes. What to do with it all. So if you start to pick... And we, and we we sort of seen curiosity as a, as a navigating tool. So if you think of what's your North Star, where are you trying to get to, you can explore, 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 but at some point you have to pick a destination. And when yeah. you start to pick that, then you can curate 
the information, the people, the knowledge around you, uh, uh, you know, as you get more into it. And one of the things Paul's alluding to is this idea of if you pick a project and you have something on your event horizon, this is why we talk about exhibiting or showing off what you're doing in some way, even though it's, if it may be excruciating, perhaps you want to learn a new piece of music. And, you know, Alan Rusbridger, who's the Guardian editor, famously wrote a book about learning a very difficult piano piece and he hadn't played the piano for 20 years. And then he did it in front of a group of friends not badly at all. I mean, it's amazing effort. But what he showed through that was that by learning the piece of music and putting himself in a difficult position and having a moment where he was going to show it to friends, it forced all kinds of other kinds of learning to coalesce. And so the point for, from, you, know, for you, you've got the, this HR leadership and you've got all this research. I would suggest it's probably been curated by the fact you have this show on, but you could choose any kind of project. And as, so, as long as you, you you choose something and you show it to other people, you'll find the learning curates and editorializes itself. Mm -hmm. We'll send you a copy of the book, Chris. We should have done this before. <laughs> <That's so. right. laughs> but the whole whole of part two is the uh, is around the seven C's model, and that is it's around you know, understand your context, it's yeah. around building a community, and then it's into that curation to narrow it down to the yeah. thing. Then it's your apply your creativity. Then it's put it into action with construction. Then apply your criticality to see what worked, and that gets you to your confidence. So chapter to the part two in there is is, is what you need to read them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Because I, I just kind of found myself to, I used to listen to a, a brand new podcast every day as part of uh, so every day. And I would take some, a lot of weight, but I never ended up doing it. So now I've cut it down. I actually cut yeah. down my learning, which sounds a bit crazy. So I can focus on executing what I'm learning and then kind of going back to exploring or again. Otherwise, ask, yourself, ask yourself, what are you trying to do? What, what is it that you, there'll be a reason for why this is important to you. And once you define what it is you're trying to do, it becomes easier to curate. I think that's the problem. I'm not actually looking at any North Star. I just love learning about all different things, even though it's nothing to do with my company. I'm just so interested in finding out all sorts of different things. I've got podcasts around, you know, history, some around marketing, some around. It's just I, I, I just find myself exploring all over and I take different things and normally bring them back. But I, I realize now I need to be a bit more focused um, with, with, with what I'm doing and where I'm going. Find a fun project, you know, find a reason. That's all. And yeah. these things make sense. Fantastic. Well, I'm conscious of time. I'm going to let you guys go. I feel like I'm going to make you read the entire book on the show. Um, but I appreciate you joining. Uh, if, before we wrap up, if there's sort of one parting piece of advice for everyone, um, what would that be? And, and, and where's the best place for everyone to connect with you all? I'll start with yourself, Simon. Yeah, so I guess you know, experiment, stay curious, you know, look look for where you can be curious. Uh, and in terms of one place to go, I guess it, check out our website, which is curiousadvantage.com. You can get the book from there. You can get access to the podcasts from there. Uh, the book's also on a summer sale at the moment. So uh, if you want the digital version, it's uh, at a reduced uh, price at the moment as well. So uh, get it before we change that back. <laughs> I've, I've put that in the link in the description on LinkedIn. Thank you. Perfect. Um, as well. Paul? I think that... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Garrett, go for it. Oh, I was going to say, if, if I had one thing to say or leave people with is ask big questions and challenge yourself. You know, ask, ask yourself to ask the questions and be curious about the things that um, you're always slightly afraid of and go there. Um, and if you want to get a hold of me and, and my fellow authors, uh, LinkedIn is a great place to connect with us. Fantastic, fantastic. And uh, podcasts, is it iTunes, Google Play, all the normal places? It's everywhere, everywhere. You name it. Audio Boom, Spotify, Deezer, <laughs> Apple. It's yeah. everywhere. It's called The Curious Advantage. The Curious yeah. Advantage. Podcast. Make sure everyone listening, make sure you go and subscribe. You will not regret it. There's some incredible guests on there. And um, if you're like me, you, you just love listening to podcasts while you're on the move. It's an incredible resource. So I'll grab a copy of the book whilst it's on sale. Thanks again, Simon, Garrick. Always a pleasure. And uh, I'm super excited to get into the book when I get a copy. <laughs> so yeah. I'm let's wait for you, Chris. I'll, I'll, I'll find you the sale after this. Yeah. Well, um, that spot behind you on the sh on the shelf after well, you've read it as right well. There. Yeah, that's spot there. That's spot. Give you part of the plant there. I'm running out. <laughs> early, but surely. <laughs> Thanks, a lot, guys. Wish you all the best. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Thank you. See you Take later. Care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.